So 10 seconds is exactly the time I need to introduce what we're going to talk about. And um, the talk is about, um, we might have seen some movies on doomsday scenarios. And before it was always maybe like a meteorite or a nuclear bomb, but we have a new threat. And that could be antibiotic resistance bacteria. So one of the top selling apps in the App Store is a game where bacteria spreads all over the world. And, um, and it's a dangerous threat. Um, and it's kind of unstoppable. And I think um, we will learn all about this. So please welcome on the stage, Nadine Bongartz. <laughs> Thank you very much. So I have to give a little side note about the, be the, the, the fruit fly experiment because that failed completely, I have to admit. I was 17 years old, so okay, but uh, during the experiment, uh, some of my fellow high school students found it really funny to turn the heat a little bit higher of the incubator. So right before I was ready to collect my uh, results, basically all my flies died. <laughs> So anyway, I, I hope my, um, um, my, the research that I'm doing right now is a bit more successful than that. And that has everything to do with, uh, with the war on antibiotic resistance bacteria. Very important uh, topic because um, we're kind of used to having antibiotic w whenever we need it, right? I mean, uh, we don't realize it maybe, but without antibiotics, simple surgical procedures, uh, or uh, giving birth to a baby would be a lot more risky than it is nowadays. And um, so I'm a, I'm a synthetic biologist. I look at bacteria and I understand uh, genetic code. I cannot really well understand computer code, unfortunately, maybe uh, in the future. Um, I hope so because having, uh, knowing both genetic code and computer code is actually very useful. So who knows? But I wanted to use my skills that I developed in, uh, in Delft to sort of work on a very important uh, topic that would hopefully be useful for society. And um, when I found out that there was this research group in Paris uh, that is led by uh, Ariel Lindner and also uh, Jake Wintermute is there to, uh, to work with me, um, I decided to join this team because they are looking for new types of antibiotics. Uh, and um, let me get just one thing straight before I start to talk about how bad bugs uh, are. Um, I'm also very much a fan of bacteria because they make really nice stuff. Like for example, these French cheese, I'm always very happy to be able to go to the French supermarket and uh, buy one of these. So bacteria are, are actually very uh, good things to have around and even more for our health because I don't know if you know, but more than um, uh, like 10 times more the number of human cells are bacterial cells in our bodies. And they, they play a vital role to maintain that health. So it's, it's not only uh, something that's bad, but definitely also something that's good. But like in every story, you know, they're always bad guys and they can become pretty nasty. Now, I knew about b antibiotic resistance for a long time. You know, when you study, you get uh, a lot of those uh, um, literature about antibiotic resistance. But only in 2012, actually, where I attended a summer school in Berlin, I started to really, really r realize what it meant. Um, here you see uh, maybe funny picture of me in a nice outfit ready to enter the surgery room for the first time in my life. And um, the, 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 um, uh, the surgery that was about to happen concerned uh, a man in his uh, middle ages, I think, and um, his leg had to be amputated. Now, his leg had to be amputated because of a bacterial infection. He carried a, a metal pin in his leg uh, for a couple of years to support his bone. And at one point it just started to infect. And after many, many attempts to clear the infection, nothing really worked. And so the only remedy that was left in order to make the bacteria not spread to other parts of his body was to amputate the leg. 
Well, now, I came in for the first time in the surgery room on prime time when the leg was pulled out of the patient and dumped into a plastic bag. <laughs> and that kind of was a kind of shocking experience, I have to admit. But it also made me really think, because, you know, I was studying biology, and I was like, shit, can't we really do something about this? You know, it's not the Middle Ages, but apparently we really didn't have any other cure. So I'm really happy to, to now sort of be in a position where hopefully I can contribute with, um, with my knowledge and, and skills to find solutions. Because it's really necessary. And uh, a global review on antimicrobial resistance predicted that about 10 million people could die every year by the, by the year of 2050 if, um, if resistance is spreading as it is nowadays. Uh, and it is more or less one person every three seconds. So that can go pretty fast. Now, who's on the blacklist? These are our public enemies, I would say. He, here are the top 10 drug-resistant threats, bacteria that have resistant versions to many of the antibiotics that we are using. And this guy here is my enemy at the moment. This is Mycobacterium tuberculosis. Mycobacterium tuberculosis is the causal agent of tuberculosis. And although it looks quite innocent on this picture, um, it can do a lot of harm. It's a, it's a bacterial disease that, can, uh, s that affects the lungs. Oh, I don't have a laser, I see, but I hope you can see it. It affects, affects the lungs. And if a patient has, uh, has active tuberculosis, it can cough and the bacteria can transport themselves in little droplets from one person to another. If you inhale the droplets, uh, you can get the bacteria yourself, and then they enter the lung, and soon after they, uh, they enter the lung, your immune system will go on red alert, of course, because there is an invader, but that's exactly what the bacterium wants. So it will recruit a lot of um, immune cells, and uh, once the immune cells go to the bacteria to sort of engulf it and, uh, and, and, and make sure that it cannot harm the, the, uh, the body anymore, um, the bacteria can basically do one, two things. Either it can stay in the, in the, in the immune cell and, uh, and go to sleep, more or less. It has all sorts of protective defense mechanisms to protect it, to protect it from being killed by the, by the immune cell. Um, or if your immune system is not that high, uh, if, you're, if you have a low immune system, the bacteria can actively replicate and also infect other parts of the body. Like for example, in this, this picture, you can see that a patient has a tuberculosis infection of the tongue. Now, there have been many deadly infectious diseases, of course, but Mycobacterium tuberculosis is maybe the one that has killed more persons than any other pathogen. Especially by the late 19th century, um, 70 to 90 percent of Europe and North America uh, in, the, in the urban populations were, uh, were infected with tuberculosis. And um, there was a lot of debate by what actually caused tuberculosis. You know, people didn't know. So they had all sorts of weird remedies to, to cure tuberculosis. Here, for example, um, you see um, a standard type of treatment where people would uh, go uh, sleep in the outside. They would have to get a lot of fresh air, a lot of sunlight. Even when it was cold and in the winter, they still had to go outside. And they were taken care of um, by, uh, by the nurses, but really everything was taken care of. So they, it was decided for them what, when they had to read, when they could sleep, how they could brush their teeth. And basically, death was a forbidden topic to talk about. They have all sorts of things that uh, apparently uh, had, to, had to help against this disease that were a bit contradictory to how we believe um, tuberculosis can be cured today. And finally, after centuries of speculation w w what actually caused tuberculosis, uh, Dr. Robert Koch found out that the disease was actually caused by a bacterium and he also was awarded with, uh, with the Nobel Prize. 
And luckily for us, we've passed the 19th century, um, and in, in the European Union, TB has one of the lowest uh, um, rates around of, of among other countries in the world. Um, but from a global perspective, uh, it's still a major threat for a lot of societies. It, and tuberculosis is causing more or less 2 million people to die every year. And uh, another 16.2 million are of, of, the, of, uh, of people are sick. But what we actually see is only the tip of the iceberg. Because if you look below the surface, one third of people around the world is infected with tuberculosis. And these are the people with the sort of the sleepy form of the bacteria. So the ones that can stay in the immune cells and don't grow and you don't, and you don't have to feel sick. You, you feel okay, so you don't go to the doctor. It's not diagnosed. But still there are many people walking around with this, uh, with this pathogen. And then if, you, for example, you get AIDS or you have a lowered immune system, all of a sudden the bacteria can become active uh, start to replicate and, and make you sick. Now, in the best case scenario, uh, you are in a country where they, are, they have good medicine, um, and your bacteria and the mycobacterium that you have responds well to the general therapy that we have. But it's not a lot of fun. I mean, you have to uh, stick to four types of antibiotics for two months. And then for another four months on another two types of antibiotics. I don't know for you, but I already uh, have difficulty sticking to my antibiotic treatment for a week. So you can imagine that these patients um, need some help also to stick to this program, which is really important because if you don't, there's a lot of more chance that, uh, that people become resistant against, uh, against the cure. So, yeah, the drawbacks are there. Uh, the regime is very lengthy. Uh, and another thing is it only works for the active tuberculosis. So all those people infected with the inactive tuberculosis cannot be helped with any of the... We don't have anything for them right now. Uh, and in case of, uh, of patients with HIV, the tuberculosis medication is not compatible with the HIV medication. So there's... It's a, it's a bit of a problem, as you can see. Whereas HIV patients have a reduced immune system and are m much more likely, 30 times more likely, to develop the active tuberculosis than patients without HIV. And the question is also, how long will these cures uh, be sufficient? Because multi-resistant bacteria are spreading around the globe and uh, already 92 countries reported that, for, uh, that, that, there, that there were uh, multi-resistant uh, forms of, uh, of the bacterium. Um, even, the, even there have been some reports that there are strains that are basically uh, resistant to any of the antibiotics that we have today. And th p those people have to be isolated, they have to be put in a quarantine uh, to provide any of the, uh, to provide them that they can infect other people. So I think it's pretty clear that we need new types of uh, tuberculosis drugs that are resistant, that are uh, effective against resistant mycobacterium tuberculosis, but also that help against not only the active ones, but also the inactive bacteria. And of course, medication that is compatible with the HIV medication. So this is my job. Uh, and it's a pretty tough one, because um, to find a new antibiotic is, is, um, is an interesting process. What we do is basically we look at the cell and we try to identify weak spots. So for example, if you look at antibiotics that are there today, they all target a weak spots in the bacteria. So for example, uh, the the replication of the DNA and uh, the genetic information of the bacterium is really important in order for it to, to divide and, and grow. So there are certain antibiotics that will hit a specific enzyme that is responsible for the replication of the DNA, such that it cannot do that anymore and as a consequence the cell will stop growing. 
other, uh, other antibiotics um, target the production of the cell wall, the, the membrane around the cell, that is, of course, also vital for the existence of the bacterium. So, for example, here you see a picture of, uh, of an antibiotic that targets the cell wall, and, uh, and as a consequence, the, there, there, there start to become uh, leaks in the membrane and the cell basically collapse. This is a, this is a real electron microscope picture of uh, that event happening. Now, bacteria have become resistant because they're pretty clever, you could say, but it's, it's part of, a, of, a, of an evolutionary process. And mutations are, uh, is, uh, mutations uh, appear is, is continuously, it's, it's part of, uh, of biology for that to happen. And as a consequence, it can, for example, um, happen that uh, the, the bacteria have enzymes to break down the antibiotics inside the cell so they cannot damage any of the targets th anymore. Or the, the cell can all of a sudden produce special pumps that will pump out the antibiotics from the cell and also in that way uh, the, the antibiotic is not effective. So what we have to deal with is survival of the fittest. So every time you take an antibiotic, there will always be a big population of cells that are, uh, that are susceptible for the medication, but also because of genetic variability due to evolution, there will always be a small group of cells that have these special mechanisms to either pump out uh, an antibiotic or to, to break it down, for example. And these are the guys that will survive. So even if you kill all of the other ones, they can multiply and grow in population until a point where you can be in re real problem. Another way is also, um, which is, uh, which is uh, a big problem at the moment, is that a resistant bacteria can more or less transfer its resistance to a bacteria that is not resistant yet. The way they do this is by copy-pasting resistant genes that allow them to be resistant against the antibiotic. Uh, and those resistant genes are often carried on a small piece of circular DNA that it can transfer via a, a bridge to another bacteria. So it copies this piece of information and transfers it to the, to the non-resistant bacteria. But yeah, after, the bacteria is also resistant. This is happening all the time right now. So as we move, as we travel, as we use a lot of antibiotics um, for, our, uh, for, for the animals, for meat production, uh, in, uh, f when we go to the hospital, we have patients that carry resistant bacteria. All of, the, all of the things that we do every day allow these resistant bacteria to travel around, to find um, their brothers and sisters, and to donate this resistance to those bacteria that are uh, not yet resistant, but become resistant. So, question is, Will we have an effective antibacterial therapy for the future? If you look at all of this resistance taking place, you would assume that you know, people are working around the clock to find new antibiotics, right? I mean, it's such an important thing. Well, actually, the reality is that we're starting to develop less and less and less new types of antibiotics. Um, there is no new class of antibiotics since 1980s. It was a very uh, um, popular thing to do around uh, in the 30s, where dozens of new antibiotics were, uh, were developed. But now there's a strong decline. And uh, it's also referred to as more uh, sort of the res discovery gap. Resistant bacteria are rising, but at the same time, we're developing less and less antibi antibiotics. So why is this? First reason is because it's scientifically very difficult to find new antibiotics. 
If you want to find a new type of antibiotics, you have to screen thousands of molecules in order to find something that um, might hit that target that you are looking for and that might, might kill the cell. And then if you find something that kills the cell, you of course have to test it on patients and you have to hope that, the, uh, that you can use the drug at concentrations that is not toxic for humans. Because otherwise, there is another problem and you cannot use this, this drug for, for the use in patients. Um, and although we have nowadays, we have a lot of uh, predictive models to, to know which mo types of molecules can potentially hit a certain target inside the cell, still we see that if you really do the work and you try to test those molecules in the real bacteria, uh, it often doesn't work at all. So biology is way too complex at the moment to predict. Uh, and it's also because we lack a lot of fundamental knowledge about how biology actually works. We think we know a lot, but actually we don't know enough, at least. And then the second big problem is that developing a new drug is very expensive. Um, and so if you des develop a, dr a drug, you at least kind of want to make sure that in the end, all your investments can be compensated with the profit you make. Now this is the case mostly for, uh, for, for, for cancer drugs or for, uh, for other chronic diseases where the patient has to take medicine for a long time over long, uh, uh, and, uh, and, um, and very frequently. But in the case of TB, sort of the balance between ri the risk and benefit balance for a pharmaceutical company is not that interesting. Yeah? And uh, if you look at, this, this curve, you can see how much money it takes to do all the research, to get the patents, uh, to be successful in all the different stages. And then at the end, maybe uh, if, the, if everything goes well, you can start to make a bit of profit. But you ha every time you want to test a new drug, uh, and you have to test multiple in order to find one that can really be profitable and, uh, and functional in the patient, you have to go through this process a couple of times. And pharma companies don't want to do this for antibiotics because it's, it's not interesting enough. Also because if you find something, there are still enough antibiotics on the market that work. Uh, although there is a lot of more and more resistance, still the antibiotics that work are cheap to use. So the ones that are newly developed will be put on the shelf for a long time and no profit can be made. So what can we do? Now, one, one thing that, uh, that I'm working on in parallel to the scientific work is, uh, is to develop an open source platform for the, for the development of, uh, of antibacterials. So what we want with our, within our research group is to stimulate more researchers to work together to take one part of the, of the pipeline and sort of the, to the, divide our efforts in order for everyone to take a little piece that is necessary to take a drug from very early stage research to eventually the patient. And um, this is, these are new types of models that are currently tested, but they might be able to change the situation where from a market perspective, it's not interesting enough. So maybe a non-commercial way of putting these drugs on the market could work. There are a couple of things that we need anyway. I mean, there are a lot of people that don't know about the risk of bacterial resistance. So uh, they would take antibiotics all the time, if maybe if they feel a little bit of sick because they don't understand why to, when to take a, a, uh, an antibiotic and when not. There's a lot more research necessary to really have a good understanding of what's going on in, inside of all those bacteria and how we can effectively target them. Also to find, for example, targets that, become, that, that have uh, uh, less chance of becoming quickly resistant. Um, as a, and we need to really check where all of those resistant bacteria are, are situated. You know? It's really difficult to know where, where they are. They could be among us, right? Um, and as I said, we need new business models and financial incentives also for those ph pharmaceutical companies 
to to start more uh, to work more on the development of these uh, new of these medications. And finally, I also want to mention what you can do. Now, one thing is to become a scientist uh, or an investor in uh, in uh, in companies that develop anti antibacterials. But something is really important is only take antibiotics when you really have a bacterial infection. Uh, people really confuse viral uh, viruses with bacteria. They're completely different. Uh, so only uh, yeah, bacteria will be affected by the antibiotics. And stick to your cure. I know how hard it is, but really do that. Because if you, if you don't, you will start to accumulate uh, resistant bacteria in, in your own body. So I want to sort of end with, a, with to address the question, should be we really, really, really scared about, uh, about all of this stuff? Um, maybe not immediately. Uh, we still have a lot of antibiotics that, that work, and especially here in the Netherlands, we have the lowest rate of uh, antibiotic resistance because we're pretty, yeah, we're very careful with when to use them. And I also see a lot of positive developments around, uh, around me in science. And we know a lot more about the genetics. Um, we have new strategies in mind and uh, people work on to, uh, to find ways to kill the bacteria. Um, but we cannot sit back and relax because, if you l uh, because otherwise we will probably just look like the people that, were th that, that lived in the, in the time when there were no antibiotics just like the, the guy here in the back. So um, with that, I'd like to end uh, this presentation and uh, I'm happy to discuss any uh, One any big questions. applause for Nadine, please. <laughs> um, let's take some questions from the audience. Do we have questions? We have two over here. Um, there was a news report recently about a super bacteria that was found in the United States. Yeah. And I'm not sure if you have heard about it and if you have any comments on what it is exactly. Maybe? So, uh, yeah, I s so very, very, very briefly, I have to admit I don't know the details of it. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, th it's something I have now my Google alert on um, Resistant bacteria, Mycobacterium tuberculosis, uh, you know, all of these, these keywords. And basically, I get new news items in my, in my mailbox every day about resistant bacteria found in some hospital, uh, spreading new genes. Uh, this is daily reality at the moment. Who will protect us? Like, who do you call? Yeah, it's a good, good question. <laughs> How do we protect us? I think, I mean, overall, we need to make sure that we don't misuse our antibiotics. And here in uh, Europe, the, um, the use for antibiotics uh, on animals is, uh, is well regulated. But in other parts of the world, that's, that's a big problem because, you know, if peop those animals, they, they pee and poop antibiotics in the, in, in also on plants. Those, those crops can be... Uh, can be harvested and maybe you, you don't wash those crops very well and then you can ingest those antibiotics at low doses the, your bacteria become resistant to them there can be all sorts of weird ways where you can end up with uh, with antibiotic resistant bacteria the regulation is a, a very important part if I understand. yeah definitely forcing our forcing our politicians to to invest more money in it because in the end if you look at the predictions and how much it would cost us now <laughs> to, to look for new drugs compared to a situation where uh, we, are, we are in trouble, um, well, I would say we should really... We have a question from have Ari Don. Hi. Um, so you say it's your job to find uh, new cures for this. So how do, you uh, how do you go about that? Yeah, good question. So I have a little bit of a weird approach. Um, in the sense that I don't actually work, for example, with the pathogen itself, um, but I, I'm especially interested in certain targets within the pathogen that I then engineer in another bacteria. A bacteria that is much easier to work with, um, 
that we know a lot more about because mycobacterium tuberculosis is very complex. So I do some genetic engineering tricks to put targets from this bacteria into another one. And uh, my main job is then, after making such a new bacteria with a, with a drug target, is to screen for drugs on these bacteria. And uh, what we hope is that this will speed up the process of finding new drugs compared to doing drug screens on the, on the pathogen itself. Does that answer your question? Question in the back? Um, you mentioned in the beginning something about programming, uh, that maybe it's going to help in the future to solve uh, the problem. Uh, what was that about? So, yeah, so in, in biology, just in general, in biology, uh, program is uh, getting more and more important. So um, that's why I said I'm a bit jealous on some of the skills that are around here, because I, w I would love to be a better programmer. Uh, to m make predictive models of all the different activities that are going on inside the, inside the pathogen. You know, by knowing exactly how uh, things are moving around in the cell, you can, you can um, be more precise about what kind of weak spot is essential to hit with the molecule in order to kill the cell. Um, and knowing these kind of weak, s the more weak spots we can identify, the more things we can try in order to find something new. Yes, we have another question over here. Um, you said that um, 1.9 billion people are infected with a sort of passive uh, yeah. version of tuberculosis. What would invoke that in, into becoming an active one? And can that happen? Yes, uh, that can definitely happen. So, yeah, so one of the main reasons for that to happen is a, a decreased immune system. So you have to imagine that bacteria in this macrophage that are, that are there, they are really bombarded by all sorts of nasty stuff. You know, macrophages are really cool, good pathogen killers, normally. Uh, most of the bacteria that it will, uh, that it will catch, it will, they will die from, from, from certain uh, weapons that it has to, to kill them. But Mycobacterium tuberculosis has developed all sorts of mechanisms to, um, to prevent that from happening, to protect himself. Now, I can, you can imagine that um, there's sort of a balance. There's always a sort of a war between the immune system and the pathogen. And once the immune system is just going down, the pathogen can take over more easily uh, than when the immune system is, uh, is in good condition. Are there any uh, cases known of patients that cleared uh, resistant uh, b bacteria? Ah, good. Um, not that I'm aware of. That might happen, of course. I mean, it, it could happen that the immune system itself is better able to deal with, uh, with the bacteria, but, uh, but it will never clear it completely. It will, it will then probably stay in an inactive state. So what people try then is to make sure that it's not in an active state so people can still sort of live uh, <laughs> but it will it the, the 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 body is not the ability to really get rid of the pathogen at all that's why why so many people are infected one last question so you were talking about an open resource uh, program and i was wondering how do you um when a pharmaceutical company uh, develops a uh, working uh, medicine, um, then it gets its investment back. But how does it work when you do just a part of it? Yeah, yeah. So these are one of the tricky things that we have to uh, figure out. Because um, we see that there's a role for academics to work on this problem. Uh, because there's a lot of, uh, basically for researchers, the incentive is to publish, to create new knowledge, to um, not, it's not a commercial incentive, so in that sense it's good, but we want to have recognition. There might be patents that need to be shared, even if you would uh, sell your, your drug for a cheap price, you still want to have maybe some sort of protection. So I don't think that 
uh, you, I mean, I can say open source, but I don't think it will be 100% open source. Uh, I think we should find a sort of a balance between what people, uh, how people can be incentivized to work on something that is less commercial, but still gain certain benefits that are important for them. Of course, you need that. Otherwise, uh, even for a researcher, it has to put his or her name on a paper in order uh, to, to, to stay in his career. So these are very difficult things. It's, it's a nice idea, but we still have to figure out a lot of things to make it work. Cool. We have a gift for Nadine. Oh. In the meantime, please give a very big applause. Thank you very much, yeah, Nadine. Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot. Our next talk will continue on, the, on biotech. It will be about DNA, about uh, observing to uh, using DNA as building blocks.